welcome to the very first episode of the I Am a Christian podcast. I am Ohis. Now, before we dive into today's topic, I want to take the time to thank all of you for your love and support. I remember when I first announced that I will be launching this podcast. So many of you reached out to me with prayers, with words of encouragement, with you know advice and support. I'm so overwhelmed by you know all of the love and I really want to say a big thank you. Now, one more thing to address before we move on into today's topic uh, is the question, why have I decided to call this podcast, I Am a Christian? See, over the past few years, uh, uh, I have become actively involved in engaging in conversations about societal values and also observe trends. I noticed that what it means to be a Christian have been distorted. I noticed Christian values and influence in society have either been eroded or redefined. I saw a lot of co-opted language being used. So, for example, this is when you hear words like justice, love, tolerance, empathy and the likes being used. And these are words which Christians can easily identify with as biblical terms. But I noticed that they meant something completely different in the context that they were being used. And a lot of people were falling for them what well, still falling for the manipulation so uh, christians have never stopped to ask themselves or to identify how this language that has been used is shaping our society and pushing up biblical christian principles so this is why i named this podcast i am a christian it is to bring all of us back to the basics of what being a christian truly mean and how this should play out in our daily lives so, with all of that being said, today's episode is actually named I Am a Christian. And we're going to be looking at this topic from two parts. Now, the first part is, what does it mean to be a Christian? And the uh, second part is, how does this play out in our daily life? So, when you go out, when you interact in public as a member of society, when you, say, listen to the news... When you hear a story, how do you interpret this? How do you digest, you know, things? And so, yes, the the, the little things, really, it's what we're going to be looking at today. How does being a Christian affect all of that? So should, um, should your interaction in society, for example, shape what you believe as a Christian or should your Christian beliefs shape how you interact in society. These are the things we are going to be looking at. So thank you once again for being here. Thank you once again for all the support. Uh, Yes, let us go. All right, welcome back. And um, today we're looking at the topic, I am a Christian. So what does it mean when you say you are a Christian or... What does it mean when someone asks you the question, are you a Christian? And you answer yes. You see, years ago I was asked the same question and my answer was a straight yes. I didn't even stop for a minute to think about it. My answer was yes. But hey, you can't blame me. I was born into a Christian home. I've always attended church. I have participated in many Christian activities. I can quote the Bible. I can pray. So, you know, yes, I am a Christian. I was raised as a Christian and it is who I am. But boy, oh boy, was that thinking so wrong. You see, as it turns out, you are not a Christian because of any of the above. Just like painting yourself green doesn't make you a native of Greenland. Because you see, every time you make the claim that you are a Christian or whenever someone asks you the question, there are certain assumptions that accompany the claim or accompanies the question. And it is expected that you fully understand the assumptions and the implications of the assumptions. Now, after we finish today... I want you to take a minute and ask yourself the question again. Am I truly a Christian? So assumption number one, 
when you say I'm a Christian, the first assumption is you know what the word Christian means. Now you know of its origin and you know of its context. So you know the origin of the word and you know the context in which the word was used when it was first used. Assumption number two is that you know, you understand, and you have willingly chosen to embrace and live a Christian life. The third assumption is you can clearly explain how you became a Christian, when you became a Christian, and why you became a Christian. Okay, let's look at the very first part. What does Christian mean? Now, if you look at our world today, you would see that evil is thriving. And there is a simple reason for this. It's because a lot of people know about the religion of Christianity, but not a lot of people know about the truth of Christianity. If you pay close attention to the life of Jesus, you would notice that in his day, he had a lot of disagreement with the religious people, with religious people. And there is a reason for this. Embracing religion without truth separates you from God. Now, there are a lot of rituals that come with religion, but they're not really true. It's more about self. It's more about man than God. But the truth about Christianity is this. It is a relationship with God. It is a relationship that was instigated by God through the person of Jesus and it's a relationship that's maintained by the Holy Spirit. And so for a lot of people today who know the religion of Christianity but not the truth, they are lost in the rituals that the religion presents to them. And it's easy to believe that the rituals are akin to what a Christian life should be, but this is not so. So let us deal with the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, according to the dictionary, a Christian is one who have the manner and spiritual character proper to a follower of Christ. The question then becomes, who is a follower of Christ? And what is the manner and the spiritual character of this person? Well. Luckily for us, the Bible describes this clearly. In John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Why do they follow me? To answer that question, we have to go back to John chapter 10, the very same John chapter 10, from verse 1, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now the sheep follows, knows the voice and follows Jesus because they know him as the shepherd. So in verse 3, he says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now, Jesus tells us this is the manner and character of one who is a follower of Christ. Now, the person who is a follower of Christ must know the voice of Christ. The person who is a follower of Christ must recognize the voice of Christ, must recognize that he is shepherd. And they must also, they must run away from strangers. They must run away from the attraction that those strangers present to them. They must run away from the distraction. They must run away from the seduction. They must run away from the attempt of the stranger to turn their hearts away from the shepherd 
to turn their hearts or their focus away from following the shepherd, which in this case is Jesus Christ. Let us look at another scripture that explains these a little bit better. In John chapter 14 from verse 15, it says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. So what is the manner and the character of a follower of Christ? They love Christ and they keep his commandments. If you are a Christian, you love Christ and you keep his commandments. Okay, so now that is the manner and character of a follower of Christ. Well, where does the word Christian come from and what was the context in which it was first used when it was used? You see, the word Christian was first used to describe the followers of Christ in Antioch. Contrary to the false narrative that have been peddled for years, it wasn't used as an endearing term, nor did it have its roots in or anything to do with religion. So when Jesus died he and he resurrected and he went back to heaven, his message and the examples that he gave continued to thrive and drive all those who were left behind, who believed in him and they lived their lives according to these messages and you know according to his examples. And they were persecuted for it. So the name Christian was introduced as a label to identify and mock the followers of Christ. It wasn't a religious movement. It was a way of life. It was a relationship between man and his creator. Now, there wasn't any organized way of doing things. People met anywhere they could to share their experiences and encouraged each other with the teachings of the one they believed and loved. And even though they faced a lot of persecutions for this, even though um, those who did not believe in what they believed in tried to lure them away from it, they kept on holding on to the messages and examples of Jesus. Why? Now remember, John chapter 10 verse 27 says again, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They will never follow a stranger. They would never follow any distraction. And this takes us into the second assumption. What is the second assumption? The second assumption is that you know, you understand, and you have willingly chosen to embrace a Christian life. So, you are a Christian. Yes. Now, what does this mean? What does living a Christian life mean? Let us look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Put everything evil out of your life. Sexual sin, doing anything immoral, letting sinful thoughts control you, and wanting things that are wrong. And don't keep wanting more and more for yourself, which is the same as worshipping a false god. Now, one of the things about about living a Christian life is you fully subscribe to the idea that God is sufficient for you. This means that you are not covetous. Now, I remember talking to a friend of mine and, you know, this conversation came up about all rich people and how they have so much and other people don't have. And I remember saying to this guy, do you know that envy used to be one of the deadly sins until we turned it around and it became more of a social justice? So, co-opted language, social justice. We want what the rich people have. We believe that they should not have that. We think it should be everybody else's. You must have heard the idea before. Why don't we take from the rich and redistribute it? What, is, what could be wrong with that? Covetousness. If you truly are a Christian, you should know and you should be subscribed to the idea that covetousness is a sin. Now, whether the rich guy is rich because he's stolen from everybody or he is rich because of his hard work, it 
it's none of your business. You, it does not justify you converting what he has. This is what it means to live a Christian life. You understand that God is sufficient for you. Well, that is one aspect. Another aspect is that even when you have, you understand, you know when you understand that what you have, God has given to you for a reason, for a purpose, and you do not amass more and more to yourself and keep more and more to yourself. You do not become greedy. That is another bit of leaving the Christian life where you know this, you recognize this and you choose to embrace and leave this lifestyle. Now, another thing that passage tells us is that we must put everything evil out of our life. What does this mean? This covers pretty much everything. Now, it covers everything from eating too much, which can be evil, to sexual sin, for example. Now, the topic of sexual sin is something I am going to talk about in a separate episode because sex is it's a very big topic. The Bible says, mortify yourself. Now, I remember looking up the word mortify, and it actually says to discipline yourself, to restrain yourself. Is sex a bad thing? No. It's sex outside of the purpose for which it was created a bad thing. Yes. So everything that does not meet the purpose for which it was created, it is bad. But like I said, yes, we'll talk about that in a different episode. But, okay, so understanding, you know what the Christian life is about, you fully understand it, and you will subscribe to the idea of leaving a Christian life. You are leaving a life that pleases God. Now, this lifestyle dictates how you think. It it dictates um, how you talk. It dictates your actions. It it dictates how you interact with people. It dictates how you see things. Now, this is the thing about knowing and understanding the Christian lifestyle. Now, if you know and understand this, this lifestyle and you willingly choose to embrace it and leave it, then certain things are expected of you. And there are lots of implications to this. Now, there are lots of sacrifices to make. There there are a lot of um, discipline that it requires. Is it easy? No. But this is what it means when you say you're a Christian. So when, when you make the claim that I am a Christian or when someone asks you the question, are you a Christian? And you say, yes, this is what they expect. That, okay, you should have this discipline of living a Christian Christian lifestyle. Now, the third thing, the third assumption is this. You can clearly explain how you became a Christian when you became a Christian and why you became a Christian. So, um, how did you become a Christian? Well, so many people have their different, different testimonies. And when? Well, you can clearly say, this is when I became a Christian. This is when I gave my life to God. And why did you become a Christian? So what are the implications of answering these assumptions? Now, one is everywhere you go, people should always see the teachings and examples of Jesus mirrored in your life. The song, let my life be a picture of you comes to mind. Let it be a letter written by your hand for the world to see, to read and to feel and to know that you live in me comes to mind. Now, number two thing is you should never be ashamed or scared to stand up for what God's principles are, regardless of whether it is a popular opinion or not. Number three thing is you should be living a holy life. And number four thing is people will always require a higher standard of morality from you than everybody else. Now, do not deceive yourself. Everybody out there knows what is expected of one who is a Christian. Everyone knows the standard. Well, whether people choose to live up to the standard is a completely different thing, but they know. And they, if you say you are a Christian, they will look to you and say, hey, you should believe enough to the standard, even though they don't really believe in the Christian way of life or they don't leave it themselves. So that is another thing to another implication that you have to prepare yourself for. And if all of this is not applicable to you yet, then maybe you should take a minute and 
re-examine yourself and ask yourself the question, am I truly a Christian? Let's take a short break and when we come back, we will look at the second part of today's topic. How does this play out in daily life or how should this play out in daily life? You are listening to the I Am A Christian podcast on I Am Ohits. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you once again for being part of this vision, for supporting this vision. Now, one thing I will like to ask of you today is to remember to like, to share and subscribe on the platform where you get your podcast from. Also, leave a comment. This helps to grow this vision even further. So let's get back to today's topic. All right, welcome back. And today we have been looking at the topic, I am a Christian. Now, what it means to be a Christian, the assumptions that the claim or the answer to the question or the question itself presents and the implications of these assumptions, now what is expected of you. So in this second part, we are going to be looking at how these play how does this play out in our daily life or how should this play out in our daily life should what you believe as a christian shape how you interact so how you interpret and how you perceive what goes on in society or should your interaction in society shape what you believe now this is the question so what does this mean in the wake of you know social uprisings you know such such as the the BLM movement you know the the abortion brigade the LGBTQ ideologies and all of that what should a christian do should we interact based on the prevailing narrative in society or should we say hey, I am a Christian and I am going to address this from a Christian perspective. So this is what we want to talk about. Now, as a Christian, the first thing we understand or the first thing you should understand is God is first, he is all and he is everything. God is first. Why? Because Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that in the beginning, God, God is first. He is all. He created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. And he is everything. He is the first and he is also the last. Now he is the creator and he is also the judge. Now he is the one who put us on this earth. He is the one who is going to judge us. It is by his rules that we all live and breathe. It is by his rules that we ought to operate. Now, God's principles, these principles which he has put in place that we should recognize as first and all and everything, supersedes everything that goes on in our societies. Now, what do I mean by this? It means that God's principles are not limited by time. They are not limited by place and they are not limited by the prevailing sentiments. People will say, Most of the things you Christians talk about, biblical things, all of this happened, you know, so many years ago. We are in the 21st century now. All of this should be updated to, you know, fit in or maybe relegated because, well, society don't want to buy into that anymore. No, it does not work like that. God's principles applies to all, regardless of time. So whether you're in the 21st century or you're the 16th century, God's principles are God's principles. It takes first place. It is not regulated by prevailing sentiment and it cannot be relegated. These principles are all noted out in the Bible. Now the question a Christian will want to ask himself when faced with societal issues is this. Does my response to this issue reflect God's principles? Are they grounded in God's principles? Or am I selling out my faith on this particular issue? Now, the thing with having principles is that you want to make sure that you are known for a particular thing. Your yes is yes and your no is no. So, 
whenever you're reacting or whenever you're interpreting a certain thing, societal discourse, you want to ask yourself, am I selling out my faith for fame maybe or for money or for even peace of mind? Because um, something I have seen, it's a lot of Christians are actually afraid of upsetting people. And so because of this, we do not, tell people the truth we do not stand our ground on what biblical principles are so you might want to consider if i am not leaving out biblical principles in my day-to-day life am i still christian in the true meaning of the word Now, why is this important? Well, this is important because every day we are bombarded with different situations. We know we are bombarded with lots of information about different things and we are expected to have opinions on these different matters on the go. Now, one thing the Bible advises us as Christians is we should be slow to speak. We should be quick to listen, but slow to speak. Now, the reason is because of the second thing, which is very important to your life as a Christian, and that is truth. Truth is very important because you always want to make sure that you're reaching the right conclusions. You always want to make sure that you are taking the right decisions. Now, for this very reason, Apostle Paul advised Christians to be like the Berean Christians. Now, the Berean Christians, as we know in the Bible, were Christians who, every time they hear a teaching, every time they receive a piece of information, they will go back home and check to see if that piece of information, if that teaching that they have received is true, if it correlates with biblical principles. Now, how does this play out in our life? Whenever we receive a piece of information, the best thing to do is to test that that information is true, is to question everything. Now, I always say to people, shut out emotion when dealing with finding out truth. The reason is because truth is malleable when appealing to emotions. So, for example, the racial debate. Now, I know for a lot of people, this is something that they get very emotional about. But the truth is, a lot of what we hear with the racial narrative, it's just that, a narrative. It is not the truth. But it takes one to put aside their emotion and test the information that's coming out to see whether it is true or not. Now, as Christians, this is very important because we know that Jesus describes the devil as the father of all liars. Now, as Christians, when we live our lives not according to truth, but according to lies, what this means is that we are living our life based on uh, what the devil has orchestrated for us and not according to what Christ has orchestrated for us because we are followers of Christ so we should be followers and seekers and pursuers of truth and not live our life based on lies. And we are also mandated to teach this truth to first to our family, our kids and also to those around us, our community, our nation. So whenever something comes up, we must seek out what the truth is about that particular thing according to biblical principles and we once we know what the truth is we are mandated to teach the truth to everyone so this is how we live out our christian lives on a day-to-day basis one more thing to consider before we round up today's episode is um uh, the instruction that's found in hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh, So this is not by any means the very last thing in terms of how we ought to live our lives as Christians in a public space. But for these 
episode of this podcast. This will be the last we'll be talking about today. So what does it mean to follow peace with all men? Now, every time I read that scripture, I'm reminded of the fact that that instruction is given to us as Christians. Now, it does not guarantee us that the people whom we are instructed to be peaceful to us will be peaceful back. It does not tell us who these people are, what they would look like, or where they will be from. It simply says, follow peace with all men. And this includes everybody. So, both the people you like and the people you do not like. Which, I mean, you're supposed to like everybody anyways, but both the people you like and the people you do not like. You are to follow peace with every last one of them. And holiness, holiness in the way you talk, holiness in the things you do, holiness in what you do for fun, holiness in the way you dress, holiness in what you feed yourself, what you feed your mind, what you feed your body, holiness in the places you go, holiness in the books you read, holiness in the movies you watch, holiness in the conversations you you have, holiness in how you go about your business. Now, it is important for you as a Christian to live out your life in this way. I'm going to leave you with this one thing, and this is uh, something my mom always said to me. Oh, he's, you are an adult. Now, nobody can dictate to you how you should live your life, but always consider this one thing. Whenever you want to take an action, Ask yourself, does this match up with what God expects of me? You have been listening to the I Am A Christian podcast. I am always.